All right. Well, thank you all for joining. My name is James Gibson. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Quotely, which is a local Gainesville startup, but I am also the president of the board of Start GNV, Gainesville's local 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to promoting startups and technology in Gainesville. Uh, very excited to be moder moderating this uh, panel AMA with three awesome executives from local tech companies who have recently sold and or are in the process of selling uh, their, their companies. Um, and so really looking forward to this AMA. Before we get too far into that, though, I want to start by thanking Start GNV's sponsors. Um, without these sponsors, these kinds of programs and all the other programs that Start GNV puts on would not be possible. So we want to thank uh, 352, Fracture, Sharpspring, Trimark, OPE Software, Santa Fe College, Infotech, Voss Systems, aka Alert Trace, uh, Admiral, Better Me Productions, Florida Credit Union, PS27 Ventures, San Felasco Tech City, uh, Hutchison PLLC, a law firm, and the Guide to Greater Gainesville, a wonderful magazine about uh, Gainesville, who is our newest uh, sponsor. Um, so thank you all to all of them, all great companies, all great places to work, uh, great law firms, great people to rent space from. Um, and, and thank you so much to them for donating the money that makes this kind of programming and all the other programming that Start GMV does possible. Uh, with that, I'd like to briefly introduce our uh, three panelists. And we will then, uh, the first question will be asking them to introduce themselves. So I'm just going to give a very, very brief introduction. But before we get too far into that, we love to take a photo at these events. So if everybody could turn on their cameras real quick, and we will snap a photo of this wonderful group uh, so that we can put that on our social media and, and use it to promote more events like this. All right. One if you're not comfortable with that, that's totally OK. But we'd really appreciate it. Uh, you know, it only takes a second. All right. Uh, one, two, three, smile. Awesome, thank you so much. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, and I'm just gonna go in order that they appear on my screen, uh, Tim Broom, who is the co-founder and CEO of IT Pro TV, wonderful, awesome local company. We'll, he'll be introducing himself in a moment. Uh, David Messias, if I hope I got that right. Uh, <laughs> nope, sorry. Uh, CEO, CEO of uh, Shadow Health. And I, I hope Rick is back. Uh, Rick Carlson, who is the CEO of SharpSpring, he was having some technical difficulties. And if he hasn't rejoined, he will be rejoining shortly. Uh, with that, I'd love to, uh, our first question is gonna be a, basically an introductory question. So going to Tim first, uh, as a founder, could you give us just a brief history of your company, uh, your role and where your company is today? Okay, I was, uh, we were in the classroom training business from 2000, and as the classroom training business evolved to synchronous web-based training, uh, typically on uh, IT infrastructure, cybersecurity, um, to a synchronous online web-based version, it can, learning continues to evolve. And about uh, 2011, 2012, we decided that we could think of a better way to provide learning at a lower cost and provide more resources for people if we kind of did it in the subscription Netflix style of format and create a learning product that was a little bit different, but it was a two person format, kind of like an evening talk show type of learning. So we can try to recreate what is best about a classroom experience. And that's where people interact and ask questions that maybe you haven't thought of yet. So we kind of designed around that with our single course. And then we started add, adding multiple courses and then started getting some legs when we launched. And uh, IT Pro TV is now seven, eight years old, and we continue to, to grow each and every year. That's awesome. And uh, so you, your company was recently acquired by ACI Learning, is that correct? So last October 31st, we were acquired by ACI Learning, which uh, has some of the uh, classroom training for veterans that we used to do, something similar to that. They had another acquisition that was called uh, MISTI for MIS Training Institute, which does audit, internal audit, cyber IT audit, and uh, other type of learning such as that. So we kind of combine that and use our resources to create content to help them bring to market through a subscription base, those types of courses. Awesome, David, same question to you. Could you guys give us just a brief history of your company and your role and where your company is today? Sure, sure. So 2011, um, <clears throat> me and two other uh, guys started Shadow Health um, it was a healthcare simulation play 
I remember reading a a journal that was kind of the the uh, uh, Institute of Medicine, um, which was a state of the union. And I remember thinking um, it, it kind of laid out all the challenges with healthcare from the system level, from all the health systems, all the way down to the, the practitioners. And so it gave us an opportunity to, to say, you know, where could we uh, disrupt this healthcare problem and an opportunity? And so we introduced a conversation-based um, <clears throat> capability within nursing education. Um, we sold directly to the, the universities, the nursing schools. Um, <clears throat> we appreciated that there were probably 3,000 schools in the market. Um, we started off with four our first year out, and we ended off with about 3,000 prior to selling to Elsevier. Um, uh, that was in December 7th of last year. Fantastic. Congratulations. And I don't know if Rick has rejoined. Uh, Rick, are you with us? I am. I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so Rick is All the right. CEO, CEO of SharpSpring. And uh, Rick, could you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about SharpSpring uh, when you started the company, how the company got started, and where you all are today. Yeah, sure. Uh, first things first, I won't be on video today, guys, which, uh, trust me, is not a, uh, not a big loss uh, for the event, uh, but uh, having some connectivity issues, so uh, just dialing into this. Um, so, yeah, SharpSpring, uh, we started SharpSpring officially in 2012. I ended up... Uh, meeting our CTO, Travis Witten, uh, in, at the early part of 2012, about the time that Groove Shark was sort of, um, I would say, in their last year of, of, of business and really having a, having a tough time with the uh, record labels, if you guys are familiar with that story. And uh, I think Travis came on board in April of 2012, and it took us a couple years to uh, build an MVP, and we launched in uh, our, our first product in 2014, um, and since then we've grown. We, I guess, I should tell you what we do. For those of you who don't know, we're a, a marketing automation company. Uh, we actually think we're more of a revenue growth company now, which broadens the the feature set from uh, just not just marketing automation, but social and integrated CRM and analytics and landing pages and forms. And the idea is that it's an integrated suite that is really anything a business would need uh, or just about anything a business would need um, to succeed um, from a digital marketing and, and sales perspective. Um, so uh, we've built that over the last, uh, whatever, nine years, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our biggest competitor is HubSpot. We also compete with Active Campaign. Um, along the way, we sold the business uh, actually pretty early on um, to a public company and then outgrew that little company. And in that process, we became public uh, essentially ourselves. We outgrew the company and then sold off the, the business unit that acquired us. And so we've been running a, a public company for a while. Um, People ask why why we're public. That's that's the story. We didn't really sort of do it voluntarily because it's a, it can be a big burden. Um, and then I guess the most recent news is that we um, uh, announced uh, roughly a month ago that we were going to be acquired by Constant Contact. And maybe maybe a lot of you know who Constant Contact is. Um, but they are certainly uh, known for uh, email marketing and one of the biggest brands in email marketing out there. So we're pretty excited about that. Incidentally, I'm talking on the phone. I can't read the room at all. So I feel like I'm droning on. Uh, so interject at any point if I'm uh, taking up too much air in the, in the conversation. No, that's, that's perfect. And that's a great introduction. And uh, great to, I guess, to note then that you've actually uh, gone through this process of being acquired once, and now you're going through it again, um, which is, is even wonderful experience for this panel. Uh, for the audience, so this is a AMA. This is an Ask Me Anything session. Uh, we've got three awesome founder CEOs here who are here to answer questions, uh, appropriate questions. 
I will note for the audience that um, anytime a company is acquired, there's a lot of details of those acquisitions that are not public and that our guests will not be free to comment on. So if you ask a question, you may get a, I can't answer that. Um, nothing personal. That's just the nature of this business. And this is still a fantastic opportunity to ask uh, some, some cool questions of some really fantastic local business leaders. Uh, so with that, if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. You can uh, message the Start GNV user directly. That's Lauren, and she will filter those questions and send them to me. And then I can pass them along to our guests. Uh, you can also just put them in the chat generally. Um, with that, you know, would love to ask, uh, um, so just to, I guess, clarify this. So Tim and David, your acquisitions are, are closed. Is that, that, that's totally correct? That's correct. And Rick, y'all are in the process of, of, this, of this, which I imagine is even more complicated for a public company. That's correct. Great. On both counts, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so, you know, first question um, for me, I think, this is my personal personal privilege here as a founder. We heard from your introductions when you started the company, when you decided to sell it. It sounds like you know somewhere between seven and ten years for each of you. When you started the company, would you have predicted you know that was the plan? I was going to sell it in in this amount of time, or was did the, did the plan change? I'd love to hear whether or not uh, the ultimate result was was what you had originally planned. Um, and and David, let's go to you first with that question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think that um, you ever have uh, a, a specific timeline in mind. Um, the, the way that I've always approached business is, is to say, how much value am I creating uh, for my investors, for my customers, for my employees? And so the value question is the one that has always been the most important to me. Um, if, if I'm delivering value to the, the customer, um, that typically takes care of, of the value to, that's created that, that the, the employee has to create. And then also, you know, again, we're creating value for the shareholder if, if the customer is, is happy. So the short answer is no, I, I, I never really thought about um, you know, you, you, I had a, I had a valuation in mind, um, from day one, that was a goal for the company, but it was never something that said, all right, guys, this is what we have to run to. Like, you know, it wasn't like something that I held over everybody's head every meeting. Totally makes sense. Um, uh, Rick, same question to you. You know, when you started, uh, Sharp Spring, I guess you've done this twice now. So when you started Sharp Spring, was that the plan? And, and did the timeline line up with your original expectations or did the plan change? My the Zoom uh, is yelling at me at the same time you are about being muted and unmuted and so forth. So I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so um, no, not a chance um, to to, uh, we were not so bold as to believe that we were going to build a company that, you know, at, at times had as many as 270 or 80 people in it. Uh, right now, I think we're about 240. Um, you know, it, it uh, became something that was much, much more than we ever sort of dared, dared to dream about. Um, to be honest, I imagined that, uh, we would build a company about to where actually our first acquisition happened pretty early on. It was only eight or 10 months after we launched our product. It was mm -hmm. semi obvious we were going to be successful and we hadn't brought on any venture capital at that time. We had uh, bootstrapped it, but I, I really, so that came almost a year or two early. Um, but that acquisition was what I would have said would have been a success for Sharp Spring. Um, I think it's fair to say that my, myself and, and Travis imagined ourselves launching another startup and doing some something different after selling the business to uh, a company. The, the little company was called SMTP, the public company. And what ended up happening is just we, you know, we we didn't see an end to to the success of Sharp Spring, and we got a, a neat team together that. Um, 
everybody or most people enjoyed working together and and uh we just felt like we could keep keep doing it and the board of the company that acquired us asked me to be um, the ceo and uh and so we sort of fell backwards into the the second life of sharp spring um just through inertia but no we had no no aspirations of the company being um as successful as it was and and is and um um, you know, we, we count ourselves lucky, uh, every, every day for that. Awesome. Uh, Tim, same question to you. Was, was, was this the plan? <laughs> I, I don't believe it was the plan. I, you know, in the beginning, we wanted to create something that we wish that we would have had when we were getting into IT and we wanted to make it easier and remove obstacles to people's success. That was really our mission and our, what our goal was. And to build a great organization with a great culture, with a great team that you love to work with, and you didn't feel like you had to go to work every day. And it was really, that was really like the idea. And of course, we wanted to, to grow and, and be successful and, and make our customers successful and our team members to help them grow, provide a lot of leadership training to develop leaders for the community and within our organization. And then I started getting these phone calls and emails. And, you know, you go to a couple of SASTER conferences or an ASU GSV conference, some of those learning conferences, higher ed, you know, type conferences, and you're meeting people, and then they kind of start bombarding you. And then you start thinking, if I don't, and we bootstrapped everything, um, but if I don't make investments into the organization to grow faster, the expectation is that you're going to continue to grow faster, faster, faster. And if you start to slow that growth and the potential opportunity for evaluation and how they look at your organization, I think, begins to, to suffer from that. So it's really some of that, as I feel like it's the right thing to do is to look for growth equity and find the right partner that's going to inject some, so, you know, a smaller amount of capital to help us grow to be bigger. And we kind of started that process. I didn't know what I was doing. The first time I really met David was down at uh, the Florida Venture Conference where we pitched in front of a, a bunch of people. And it was the very first time, I don't know if David knows the story, but it was the very first time that I ever pitched it. I've never pitched before ever. And I had some people here that kind of helped me prepare. And I won $100,000 for like the best pitch for the organization. And I truly thought to myself, man, this fundraising thing is gonna be easy. <laughs> this is a piece of cake. And that was just the start of um, really a two or three year long haul talking to people entertaining you know go through that process to eventually you know find a new home for the organization but i really felt like it was the right thing to do for us to help us grow and to be better and to help more people around the world it wasn't just about you know selling you know growing it and selling it for me awesome let me add to that before we start uh, tim you earned every dollar of that hundred thousand it was one of the best pitches i ever heard so you're being very kind david I, I, I'm just Is there a recording it. of this pitch? I, I feel like our audience would be very interested. <laughs> Somebody needs to find it. Somebody needs to find it. It was. Ah. It was. I I wanted to give him money, and I was trying to raise him money. <laughs> like this is not supposed to work this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Um, we've got a question from the audience that Tim, I think, it really segues nicely into into your answer there uh, from Michael Bafar, who uh, is a, another local founder. He asks, um, "How do the communications be?" Begin with the entities that came to acquire your business? Like, did you just meet at a conference or, or, or did they cold call you? How, how'd you meet your acquirer? The people that ultimately, you know, acquired us, uh, we, I had kind of met and they used to own the InfoSec conference business. And of course we went to go present at the conference and then we started talking to them. And so there was, they had an interest in, originally they kind of pitched a no cash merge, which I didn't feel like doing that, like that was the right thing for the organization. And they stayed in touch. I went through a, a period of time where I had a banker that, that worked with us, which is a whole nother story about, you know, how to do something properly or learn from my mistakes. And then once we ended that relationship, uh, we kind of connected again and they came back and said, what if we do something different? Are you interested in a total acquisition and, you know, joining forces and making a two plus two equal five situation? So it kind of worked out that way, but it took a couple of years for that to truly develop and be the right timing for both of us. Totally makes sense. David, same question to you. How'd you end up meeting uh, the acquirer for Shadow Health? So it was a cold call. Uh, we received the call and that started a, a two year conversation. Um, and it, initially I, I was a little hesitant because um, you know we've received buyout offers in year five and year seven. And um, 
you know, it, it's it's a quite of an engagement, right? It's not like you have this, you know, endless amount of time. Um, and so, you know, on 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 the third third go around, different company, um, I was I was very hesitant. I almost said, you know, took a couple calls because I was honestly saying, guys, my focus really is to grow the company. Uh, I don't know if it's a good timing. And there were, you know, several calls back to back and in a very professional way. And then finally, I just said, okay, these, these guys are, they're worth having the conversation uh, to continue. So cold call. That's really, really interesting. Just all the ways this can happen. Uh, Rick, same question to you, maybe a little different given that Sharp Springs publicly traded. Yeah, well, I'll give you, uh, I, I've had uh, a few acquisitions and just, just to cover them real quickly, I, I ran a company called Aluria Software back in 2004, which was an anti-spyware company, and we sold that to Earthlink. Uh, we did that in what I think you've just heard is a fairly common way. One of our larger uh, customers was Earthlink. We also worked with AOL at the time when that meant something. And Earthlink, after working with us for a couple of years, offered to buy us. Um, so I think that's one of the most common ways this sort of thing happens, uh, a, a long-term partnership first that seems to make sense um, as, as the relationship plays out. Uh, with uh, our sale of SharpSpring to SMTP, um, interestingly, they, had, they were looking to make strategic acquisitions. It was actually a matter of... Um, I don't know, uh, luck or kismet or what have you, they uh, uh, got caught up in our outbound marketing that we were doing at the time and, you know, got to know what we were doing and offered to purchase after a pretty short period of time. And then um, just to sort of fast forward to present day, um, we had received um, a, a number of inbound inquiries of uh, over the years and had received something that was sort of more serious. I, I don't, uh, uh, the second half of last year from, from recollection. Um, but as a public company, wh almost whether you want to or not, you have a, 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 on a personal level, meaning me as the, as the founder and the CEO, you, you have an obligation to look out for all investors and, and maximize um, investor return. And so, you know, in that sense, you're, uh, your personal aspirations can become secondary. And uh, because of the inbound uh, interest, we, we ran a process to sort of test uh, the market out there because, you know, at the end of the day, that could have been um, looking through the lens um, of, of, the, of that timing in late last year, that could have been uh, the best outcome for, investors that we, we sold. So we were sort of obligated almost to uh, run a process in order to maximize uh, shareholder value and at least test the waters. And then it turned out, you know, it's our belief that that, that was the best way to maximize shareholder value. So we ended up uh, accepting an offer from, from constant contact. Awesome. Well, so yeah, as a, as very, a uh, very sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a very different uh, mindset, a very different uh, way of going about it as a public company. Absolutely. Well, as a, as a proud holder of five shares of SharpSpring, uh, I'm a, I appreciate your uh, your diligence in doing doing the best thing for the shareholders. Um, oh, right. <laughs> fantastic! Thank you for that. Uh, and so, Aiden Augustine, who is also founder of a local company, Feather, uh, asked, um, and, and Tim, you you alluded to this. Uh, but let's start with Rick. Rick, did you use an investment banker in any of your acquisitions and any advice on, on using or not using a banker? Uh, uh, yeah, two, two out of three, I used investment banks. Um, that's yeah, the answer is uh, yeah. So as a public company, you absolutely have to, unless you really enjoy lawsuits. Um, you know, there's a very, very specific way you have to do things as a public company. I'm imagining that that is, um, although interesting to maybe to people on the, on the call, mostly irrelevant, I, I think, to the people um, who are listening. Um, but uh, we did use, I, I did use an investment bank. Um, 
at the at the end of the day, those guys are paid a couple percentage points. They can. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. I have in um, my less flattering uh, descriptions of them uh, describe them as highly educated realtors, and so uh, you know they're running around and and uh, promoting your business. And uh, but they they really can add value if you're able to establish the relationship with a you know with the right group of people. They do know the set of potential buyers and who's who's acquisitive at the time and who um, and, and they can they can essentially cast a wider net uh, than you can as a as an individual founder and um, and they can also serve as sort of a, a middleman um, for negotiations with companies that you know you don't necessarily know very well I'm, I'm contrasting that with this sort of partnership scenario that we all described I think they could get in in the way of a deal like that where you're you're working with somebody for a couple of years and that turns into sort of a natural acquisition. But if you're if you're out there really seeking to sell, I think an investment banker is I'd begrudgingly say that they've got a lot of value that they can add if you pick the right one, in my opinion. Makes sense. David, same question to you. Have did you all use a banker in your acquisition? Um, you know, I I would agree with Rick that they have uh, definitely upside that you don't have access to in terms of uh, how many potential acquirers there are. Um, you know, we were at a, a position where um, we, we were trying to make a decision on taking in a, a pretty large round and uh, we were allowing a competition to take place between uh, the private equity and the strategic acquire of candidates. And so we thought uh, a, a, an IB would, would really play a, a strategic role. Um, we interviewed uh, three, four, and we just couldn't turn the corner on um, the, the cost value ratio. Um, so we decided to go without it, but Clearly, they play a role of, of strength if you can afford it. I just couldn't afford it. Wonderful. Tim, it sounds like you had a, uh, an interesting experience, potentially. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely, I learned a lot. I, I do think that they can add value. I think the, the realtor analogy works pretty well. Uh, but in the end, I the person that, we, that bought us was months before we ever signed a contract the contract term ended, the 12 month tail ended, we closed the deal and then they come after us. Um, th those are the type of things that are just frustrating and you end up spending a lot of money on, on legal fees when it's truly unnecessary. So I have kind of a bad taste in my mouth about it. And I'm happy to tell anybody who, who it is individually, if you wanna reach out to me. Uh, I referred them to David a couple of years ago when we were going through the process and it just didn't work out so well. But when they say, don't worry about this, this is a handshake deal, yeah. make sure everything's in writing. Yeah. All right, well, uh, anybody in the audience, if you uh, if you wanted that reference, you know, before you sell your company, message Tim, just make sure you've got a different banker. And we'll, we'll, we'll take you up on that. Can I, uh, can I add uh, just a, a little bit? Um, because I think I'm the only one who said, yeah, we've used them, they can add value and, and so forth. I, I, I think it's really important to realize that where banks, especially, you know, guys in this role where they're shopping your company around, um, where their loyalties really lie. And in, uh, in, in most cases, it's, it's not with your firm. Uh, it should be. But it's not. So I, I was keenly aware, and, and to be to be clear, um, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking generally speaking. I'm not talking about my experience with a, with the firm that we use at all. Um, but I'm talking about the incentive structures that are set up in a in a in a deal like this. These guys know all of the buyers. They know the large companies. They know who's the head of corporate dev at Google and you know, and any other, any other firm that you, you might sell your company to. And as, as bankers, they want that relationship to be the one that they 
keep in the best possible shape because they have the opportunity to sell multiple companies to that, uh, to, to that, uh, to that buyer. And so as much as they should be incentivized to get you your maximum outcome, um, they, they want to preserve the relationships with a small network of buying companies that are out there. And so I, I just, if you're, if you're in that position and you're thinking about it, um, just always keep that in the back of your mind as you're evaluating, you know, the advice you're given and the decisions um, that you've got to make uh, on that advice. Um, just recognize the incentives and, and where, where loyalties end up lying. I want to repeat that I was, you know, I'm not talking about the, 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 any, any specific bank. I'm talking about how incentives are structured. Very wise. Thank you for that, Rick. We've got a question from David. Uh, are there any red flags in the process of being acquired? And I assume not about who ended up acquiring you, but, uh, you know, David and Rick, and you, you all have been through this a few times and maybe gone down the process without completion, open to any of you, any red flags early in the process that you would want people to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start that. Um, so, you know, my, my first response um, from my lens was always to protect the, the values that we created in our company, uh, um, for the people that we created in our company, right? So, so values and culture represented a very high um, threshold barrier that an acquirer would have to uh, validate before I was able to get to that next uh, stage of the conversation. Uh, so like I was sharing in, in, in an earlier comment, um, we received, I'm not gonna share the names, but we received a, an offer from a strategic uh, five years in. Um, and the, one of the main reasons why, I mean, these guys were a market dominant player, uh, but my gut said, no, they're not gonna take care of our people the way that I would want them to. Uh, and so I, I, I walked uh, the second, again, uh, they were, um, again, had the cash to throw around, but again, didn't align with our values as a company. And so the two red flags were though, when I met the third group, which was actually the acquirer, there was such high alignment with who they were as people. Um, you know, they became friends. And even after the acquisition, just to give you a, a glimpse, I mean, these folks are, they started in the post integration, post acquisition integration, they started every meeting with a question in terms of saying, hey, uh, you guys give us your thoughts on what we should do. And it was just, again, it had everything to do with culture and values. So those are the two red flags that I would high, you know, kind of capture as the two most important things that you guys need to be aware of. Similar to David, I, I will say that uh, there's lots of potential red flags, but fall in your gut. You know, is this, is this the type of people that I want to have a relationship with, that I want to entrust my team with, uh, that's going to carry on in our mission? Is, is it not a rip and strip situation? Are they going to help us be better? And, um, you know, there was, and I always ask my leadership team and everyone that met them within the organization, what do you think of them? How do you feel about them? You know, is that somebody that you could work with? And there were some that you know came to town that uh, people in our leadership team said, absolutely not. I, I cannot see working with them at all. And I was like, well, I thought they were pretty cool, you know. But I listened to what they said, and I know that they're watching things that I'm not seeing. So you know, taking that advice and support, and you know, moving on to the next one. And ultimately, uh, when ACI came on board. Uh, it was it was the conversation I, I was I was out of town. It was during COVID, and I had a Zoom meeting with him, and I just felt immediately of this is the kind of guy that I want to work for, work with, and that I can learn from. And I know that he's going to help our team, and he wants to elevate our team, not get rid of people, and you know help our organization grow. So I knew it was right, and from that point, let's work on the numbers, let's work on the plan, and you know make sure everything goes together. So I think if uh, 
if the questions uh, also tossed in my direction, I, I, I think of two things. Um, one, uh, there are 900 ways to have an acquisition go badly and only a few ways to have them go right. And so one of the things that I would really look for um, is um, is that the management team and, you know, especially the CEO, but the management team in general at the acquirer, it'd be fantastic if they've been on the other side of the fence and been acquired and understand what a deal looks like from that perspective. If they have that experience, um, then uh uh, that that'll that'll serve you extremely well um, because they'll understand what to do and what what not to do. Um, the other part of this that I would point out is the difference between um, private equity and strategics. I think private equity has their their own set of objectives and uh, and they're very very sophisticated and you know they may be less about building a business and more about you know building shorter term. Uh, profits, um, and so I would, I would. Uh, it's not to say that you can't make a deal work with with a private equity firm. That is for for certain, but it's uh, it's something that I would be cautious about. Thank you. That those all all really great points. And I think really valuable for the audience here. Uh, one question from Elmer is, you know, did planning for your acquisition once you knew you're gonna, it was going to happen, did it change any of your planning around hiring, around recruiting, around the product plan? You know, did, did that change once you decided, yeah, we're going to do this? Or was it pretty much, no, you know, business as usual, this is still happening until the deal is done on the side? And uh, Tim, if we can start with you. I think we started out, uh, I wanted to prove the concept. I, I read the book From Impossible to Inevitable by Jason Lemkin, the guy that kind of started Saster. And I thought that did a great job of kind of creating a blueprint of, of what you needed to do. And, um, you know, from that perspective, uh, I got like a million dollar line from Silicon Valley Bank and really took that money and invested in adding uh, director of marketing. You guys know Val, I, I think she's logged in. You know, I was doing advertising, Val does marketing and there's a big world of difference between that. Uh, I was helping with leading a sales team, but I hired a director of sales. You know, we went, we went leaps beyond where we were hired a director of production where i had someone that was just managing the studios uh, brad that came from uf you know hired some great people and then really invest some money in some marketing to kind of prove the concept because now i have something to show we put a million in here are the results and that's what really started to give us traction very interesting yeah because bootstrapping but still br bringing in some outside capital uh, and being able to show that it's just a really fascinating way to approach it david same question to do you, you know, once this was on the table, did it change your plans at all for the company or, or any of the plans within the company? So, no. Um, the, the great thing about the relationship between um, the acquirer and us, there was such symmetry in terms of mission. Uh, we both had a, a, a very narrow focus on how would our product increase the patient outcomes? How would our product train more healthcare professionals. Um, and then, uh, you know, that then came down to execution, um, you know, as, as it was consistent with our approach throughout the, the, the lifetime of the, the company, uh, we would create roadmaps for our products. Um, and so, you know, the, the three year, um, roadmap that we were working on that we had released for uh, 2019. Um, we hadn't started it. So it was really started in 2020. Um, and so they, the, the acquirer was so aligned with the role that our roadmap would play um, that it, it, it was not only a, Align, but they agreed to invest additional amounts just to fortify the the roadmap that we had developed independently. Uh, so yeah, it was it was it was a very seamless uh, acquisition, as well as you know just how aligned the two companies were. So 
nothing really changed. Great, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, Rick, same question to you. And, and I think, you know, if, if that's if the answer differs between your previous acquisitions, it may be interesting for folks to hear about when it has changed plans and when it hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think to some degree, your plans change in every acquisition, right? You're, you, you really are merging two companies. And I, I when I say merging, I don't mean necessarily of equals, but uh, I think to some degree you change. But as, as, as uh, the other folks have already mentioned, Tim and, and, and David, you, hopefully you're, you're, uh, you're selling to a company that has a shared vision um, uh, or um, a shared, certainly a shared vision of the future and something where maybe you've got complementary assets in, in uh, just, I can't get into, you know, super specifics on this um, latest acquisition, but I can tell you that Constant Contact, for example, has many hundreds of thousands of customers and they, they really like what, what we have done as a product. And we like the idea of being able to get our product in front of hundreds of thousands of customers. And we think that, you know, the rationale for the acquisition is, is almost as simple as that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would go into any acquisition expecting some level. I, I think you're, you're setting yourself up if you're unrealistic about um, the, the need to have some change, at least in your, uh, in your roadmap and your, in your vision and so forth. You're just, you're bringing to, it's like getting into a marriage or something. I'm sorry for the played out. Uh, metaphor, but, uh, but it really, it really is. Um, at the same time, you want to, you know, pick your partner wisely just to beat that metaphor to death and, 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 and make sure that it's not a complete uh, 180 uh, on your vision. Right. No, I, I, I think that Rick's point is, is well received. I, I, I will caveat by saying, I think our transaction was somewhat unique in that our acquisition, our, our, um, Acquire, they had a, a gap in their product line that we filled. And, and that had a lot to do with why the plans didn't change for us because we were entering into a, we were being integrated into a, basically a, 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 an empty component of their product line. So I, I think that's a fair point uh, of why we were unique yeah. in that. So. I just I feel context. like I need to. I feel like I need to just uh, 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 respond further. Um, absolutely, it sounds like you had the ideal scenario, and I think that's what everybody, you know, uh, everybody would love to to see happen to them, right? Where you can be acquired and just uh, just keep on keeping on because you just fit so well with the acquirer. That's that's sort of the holy grail of of acquisitions um, if you're the target of an acquisition. Uh, my, my thing, my, my comments were simply, were, were more aspirational or uh, going into something with a healthy mindset. If you don't have to uh, change, if you don't have to adapt, if you don't have to sort of merge, all, all the better, but it's a healthy way to, and I'm sure you, you, you don't disagree at all, David, that, no. that it's a healthy attitude to have to go into it with that sort of openness um, and recognition, especially as a founder, that you're not, you're not in anymore. You're not, you're not in alone. Uh, yeah. Again, that damn marriage metaphor keeps, uh, <laughs> keeps uh, popping up for me, but uh, yeah. um, it's not just because my wife walked in the room um, after, you know, 20 plus years of marriage here in this hotel. Anyway, um, never mind. Keep going. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a common metaphor, but, you know, hearing it from folks who have been through the process uh, just, you know, really emphasizes that it, there's validity to it, right? Um, Fernando asks, and let's go to you, David, you know, what did the due diligence process look like? And were there any lessons learned uh, during the due diligence process? Um, so, we had a pretty long due diligence process and um, and long in terms of, I would say it was probably two years. Um, so there was, there's, there's two reasons why it was two years. Uh, first was um, we had to first uh, agree on a value for 
the existing assets. Um, so there's recurring revenue uh, associated with the existing assets. And we were on the verge of launching um, new assets that we um, would also have to agree on the value for those. And so we broke up the due diligence in two different pieces um, so that we can agree on the valuation at, at uh, one at a time. Um, what, what I will say that I think was very important, and, and I hope that you guys hear this from a, a good place. Um, you can never um, feel like you can't walk away at any point. Because if you feel like you have to make everything work, you're not going to get the best deal. And, and I don't mean walk away because you're playing a game. I mean, walk away when all of a sudden they're no longer negotiating and they feel that they can uh, force a certain position. And so, you know, there were four or five times when, when I thought, okay, this deal is not going to happen. And I said, guys, um, you've introduced, and it was different circumstances each time. Uh, the first time it was an individual that um, just didn't have any margin for negotiation. And everything this person said, uh, they would not budge. And I said, okay, well, either you change this person or I'm walking because I can't talk to this person. I, I didn't like that person. Uh, we just, it was oil and water. And, and so they had to remove that person from the deal. And then the other two or three times, it was based on other settings and circumstances that were just not acceptable. And so if, if, if you're not committed that, look, I don't have to do this deal, uh, you're never gonna get the best deal. And, and, and that's not a, it's, um, I wasn't playing Russian roulette. I was just being true to my gut of that's not an acceptable term and I'm not okay with it. And I had to walk away. And, and, but that's what made the best scenario at the end of the day for our, our shareholders, for our employees, for our customers. So, you know, it kind of all circumstances uh, touched on those three areas. So that's, that's my piece. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Tim or Rick, any any uh, due diligence lessons? I, I would say our diligence process went pretty quick. Uh, my wife, uh, Denise, is our CFO, and she has always been awesome at her job. And we've had audited financials. So financially, the recurring revenue, all the automations that we had in place with our recurrently and our sales force and our net suite, we flew through, through um, diligence. But there's something that I didn't hear mentioned earlier. Um, what took a little bit longer was a reverse diligence on them because they're, uh, they're a company that's owned by a private equity group out of Philly. So that reverse diligence took a little bit longer because there were some things that we wanted to make sure as we, as we rolled 60% of the money that we got into the existing company, we wanted to make sure that our investment was you know going to be safe and taken care of. So um, that process took a little bit longer and I wasn't familiar with reverse diligence until I started receiving some advice and support from people as we entered that process. Uh, that's that's really important. I I learned something just now. So, uh, Rick, uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, first off, uh, I think two 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 great answers um, already given uh, to this. So, um, yeah, a, a few thoughts. Um, first things first, I would just say what David said, maybe in a slightly different way. Um, diligence, I feel like, is a really great way to get to know what it's going to be like mm -hmm. working for and with uh, the acquirer. Um, you're working with those managers on diligence, and you know if they are really playing heavy, um, you know, and not realizing that hey, there's going to be a relationship after this acquisition. Um, that's not a good sign going back to that question. You know, um, you want to feel good about the way the diligence process itself is going. 
Um, and and so I think diligence is highly indicative of how the how the post acquisition uh, you know world will will take shape. Uh, the second thing I would say is, and and I have a different experience, and you can imagine with a, a public company and 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 companies like uh, Constant Contact, who is backed by PE firms and so forth. We had just mountains of diligence, and there was a team on my side that did most of the work. I did not. I, I just want to thank. Um, you know, Aaron Jackson and everybody else on the team that um, was was doing um, that that work. I was managing the relationship, but those guys were really doing a lot of work. Um, anyway, uh, we have been prepared for diligence since the day we, you know, started the company. And I think it's a good idea for you guys to do that as well. What do I mean? Well, you know, don't start putting a bunch of, of, of open source with the wrong types of licenses in your code. Um, <laughs> you know, be thinking about the day that, uh, you know, keep your books in order. If you can, if it makes sense and you can, um, you know, have gap accounting uh, uh, in place, maybe that's, that's an idea. It's so cumbersome and expensive. Um, keep your contracts, keep your NDAs, keep it all organized. It, it will come back and be a giant mess and you know to to i guess today's the day where i use a bunch of terrible metaphors but if you're if you've got a fish on the line you do not want to be you know uh putting putting your reel and rod together um you know you want to you want a smooth process during that time and and so be preparing for diligence long before you're ever thinking about selling your company it would be um my second bit of advice and my third would just be to uh, give a you know real world example that reverse diligence is 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 absolutely um, absolutely critical you know the first time we sold sharp spring um, we we had a you know for the size company we had a pretty large check um, waved in front of us and we said good enough let's let's go and uh, we were going, part of the thesis was that um, we were going to use some of their email delivery technology, which, you know, once we got, uh, you know, behind, uh, uh, behind the wall um, or on the other side of the wall, we realized that, you know, that, that technology was terrible and we integrated it and it, uh, it, it actually, you know, we had took two steps backwards and they had acquired another company that made no sense. And so we had to wind that company down. So, that acquisition, um, while it was beneficial to us at the time, we did not do the reverse diligence. Um, and, you know, I'd say it set our company back a couple of years. I mean, we got, we got paid for that, but it, it was definitely something. And I'm uncertain whether we would have made a different decision, but we didn't do the diligence. And so we had, we had some surprises. Obviously, if you're, you know, still carrying forward a big chunk of your company, it's even more important um, into the combined ent entity. Whereas if you're getting paid on sort of day one, it's less important, um, but reverse diligence is important. So, so there's uh, three thoughts on diligence. Well, thank you for that. I know we're pretty much at time here, but I think Pablo has just asked a really great closing question. So just really briefly, he's curious what each of you are gonna be focusing your time on after the acquisition or have focused your time on after the acquisition. Um, Rick, go to you first. Yeah, sure. I have plans to, um, I, I want this to be uh, uh, successful for, uh, for the combined company. Um, we, we intend to keep on keeping on and doing some really neat things. Um, so my, my hope and expectation is to uh, keep on with, with sharp spring slash constant contact and we're going to grow in Gainesville and uh, hopefully do really, really neat things. That's, that's great to hear. David, how about yourself? Um, part of my negotiation, uh, based on you know how the highly aligned the two entities were, um, and all the existing roadmaps and whatnot, um, you know I've prior to the the move to Gainesville, I've lived in big companies in New York, um, and I I it, it I needed to have a different environment. And so I um, negotiated a, a, a time frame um, that just expired last week post transaction. And so um, I'm going to take the next couple of months to figure out what customer needs the most resources and figure out how to go and create some more value. So Great. That's, 
where I am, but that's, you know, after close to a year of transition time. Sure. Tim? I think for some period of time, uh, things won't change, uh, uh, but I know that the organization is looking to grow. There's a couple acquisitions that we want to make, and then we're going to go to market. So then I think there'll be another transition. Uh, when that happens, I think I, I will, you know, exit completely from the business. Uh, there are some uh, things as we're going through our diligence that um, some medical things with me personally that were discovered that makes me not want to go focus on another business or another startup. I just want to enjoy the joy, you know, my best life as I can with my wife and family and, you know, do everything we can. And I'm, and I'm very fortunate and grateful to be in a situation to be able to take advantage of that. Well, that's great. I, you know, thank you all for, for sharing all of that because it's great lesson, both that, you know, the, the acquisition isn't the end point. There's then more work to do, but also there's, there's more to life than building companies and, uh, you know, it makes sense to, to make sure you're fulfilling those needs. We're at time. Thank you uh, to our panelists so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to, to speak with us and answer these questions. Thank you so much to everybody who's attended. Um, you know, I, I think this is such a unique and really great event. And I, I just want to say personally, as somebody who's been here in Gainesville since 2011, this is just such an awesome place because if anybody says you can't build a company and sell it in Gainesville, <laughs> I'm going to send them this recording <laughs> because you can't. And, and it's just, thank you so much for, for uh, taking the time to answer these questions from our audience. Um, with that, uh, thanks again to all of Search EMV sponsors. Hope to see you all at future events and hope you all have a great evening. Thank you.